Hello, friends. Today, I am joined by Kelly Cumby. Kelly, thank you for being here today. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. It's an honor. Well, I'm very excited. Uh, Karen Glass recommended that I talk with you, so I know that this will be a great conversation. <laughs> Kelly is the mother of seven children whom she has educated at home from the beginning. Her homeschooling style is an organic outgrowth of her love for music, nature, stories, and tradition. So she feels very much at home in the Charlotte Mason classical stream. She's a 2018 graduate of the Searcy Apprenticeship Program, has taken literature classes from Angelina Stanford, and has been teaching literature and medieval and Renaissance cosmology to teens and adults in local co-ops and online classes since 2015. And she'll be offering a class on the Fairy Queen through the House of Humane Letters next fall with a goal of helping other homeschool moms who want to read this great work to their own children. And that sounds really fun. But before we start diving into the medieval and renaissance topic, could you just tell me a little bit about your family and how you guys got started homeschooling? Yes. Well, um, my husband was is retired military. So the first 18 years that we were married, you know, he was active duty and um, we moved a lot and had a different kid almost every place we lived. <laughs> um, but we have been homeschooling from the, I mean, from the beginning. I, I don't know if you want me to go ahead and tell you how that came about. Yeah, because I would love was, to. So I was 18 or 19 years old. I had never, ever heard of homeschooling before. And a family that I was babysitting for started homeschooling their kids. And as soon as the mom told me, we have decided to homeschool. That was the first time I ever heard that phrase. And I, immediately I just knew this is exactly what I'm going to do. So when I met my husband and we first started talking about getting married and all of that, I said, I want to have a lot of kids and I want to homeschool. <laughs> so... He said, okay, sounds good. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, if, you, if you know me in real life, you'll know that I never, ever make snap decisions. That immediate knowing that that was the right thing to do came after, you know, my whole 18, 19 years of life, I feel like, was just sort of the natural, automatic, almost outgrowth of my childhood is what it seems like to me. Okay, well, tell me a little more about that. Was that because there was certain things that you had missed in childhood or more certain things you wanted to pass on to your own children in their education? It was both. It was both. Um, so I grew up, I'm, I'm from Arkansas, and I grew up in a house that was right next to the woods and with a creek that came out into our backyard. And my best childhood memories are playing in the woods and playing in that creek and um being outside at night, looking at the stars with my dad. My daddy was a chemist, so he, he knew everything. He, didn't, he was a scientist, but he loved nature and loved the sky. And my mother is a musician and she was always playing the piano for us and that kind of thing. So all of those best parts of my childhood combined with um, you know, the fairy tales that I read and all the old books, I always loved old books and books about people who lived a long time ago and in different places. And, how they lived, um, you know, so historical fiction kind of thing, but also, you know, Little House on the Prairie and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, when I was 16 or 17 years old, I read C.S. Lewis's Surprised by Joy, and his descriptions of his early childhood before he went to school so attracted me because they were so much like my favorite parts of my own childhood. But I noticed that his mother, he said when his mother died, he was eight or nine years old when she died. He had never been to school before, but she had started him with French and they'd made a start with Latin. Presumably she had taught him to read English as well because he was reading and writing stories with his brother. Um, and I just thought how lovely that was. And then later on in the book, when he talks about going to um, Mr. Kirkpatrick and their reading Greek and Latin. These are great stories. And I thought, why can't I go to a school like that? That's what I wanted so much. Um, so when my friend, the, the woman that I was babysitting for said homeschool immediately, I thought, oh, that's, that, that's what, I think I connected later that that's what C.S. Lewis's mother was doing at home. She was teaching him stuff at home. And then also that would mean that my children wouldn't have to be stuck away in school during their early childhood at least. So 
well, and I, I didn't really think too much about the plan until after I got married and after we started having children. And I read um, Raymond and Dorothy Moore's book, Homegrown Kids, and they talk about how for the first through third grade, really, kids don't need a lot of school. They just need play outside. They need a lot of stories. They need to help around the house, that sort of thing. And then when they're old enough for fourth grade, you can put them in school. So that was my original plan. Um, the year that my oldest daughter was fourth grade, we had just moved and we were having a baby and it wasn't a good time to stick her in school. And that year also was the year that I sort of finally felt like I really knew what I was doing as a homeschooler. Things just kind of came together. And every year after that, it was kind of we'll see if there's a school that would be better for them. And then we moved again. And then we had another, you know, just it was always, things were always happening that it was always better to have them home for one more year. And then by the time my oldest was ready for high school, I had discovered online classes for great books and things that, um, you know, I had little kids that I needed to be taking care of and little ones that I needed to be teaching to read. So I found online classes for my older children and just kind of, I guess we're always homeschooling and so we always have. My youngest is 18 and she'll be graduating this spring. And so we've just always homeschooled. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, well, congratulations on graduating that seventh and final child. That's such an accomplishment. Well, I think you. a lot of the first generation homeschoolers, I'm second generation homeschooler, but a lot of um, those first pioneers speak about Raymond more, or maybe they heard him like on Focus on the Family. I know I hear that a lot of times or found a book. So um, it may not be as familiar a name. I don't hear it as often now from young new homeschool moms, but mm -hmm. um, definitely had a huge impact on that first wave of homeschoolers for sure. I was just going to say that family that I was babysitting for, she heard that Focus on the Family radio broadcast, and that's why they started homeschooling. So wow. it's for me, it's indirectly linked to that. I, I never heard the broadcast myself, but being influenced by someone who did hear it. So. Well, you heard this idea and it was connected to C.S. Lewis, which I think is so great. That's funny. I've never heard someone say, no, I think I'm drawn to homeschooling because of C.S. Lewis. <laughs> but in this idea of like the wonder and the childhood out, outdoors. So how do you feel like your approach to homeschooling changed or grew over the years? You know, when did you first start hearing about Charlotte Mason, classical education, or how did things kind of grow and change? Well, um, I read the year that my oldest daughter, I'm pretty sure it was the year that she was first grade, somebody recommended for the children's sake to me. And so I read that. Um, and there was so much in there that I just loved about what she was saying. I didn't understand how to do narration and I struggled with teaching my kids to narrate. My older kids, um, I finally had to quit asking for narrations because I don't know what was wrong. It worked out later on, but I think because I was thinking of it as a a subject or something. I don't really know why we couldn't do it. Um, but there was so much that I loved about um, what was in that book. And then um, I asked my father, because like I said, he was a chemist. I asked him, what should I be doing for my children to prepare them for the sciences in case they want to go into that? And he said, exactly what you're doing. He said, they need to spend a lot of time outside playing and just get to know the real world. And with working around the house and helping out with chores, they're learning you know, the properties of water when they wash dishes. It's just, it hadn't occurred to me that that kind of thing could be the foundation for academic studies. So between, um, and for the children's sake and things that my daddy said back then during those early years, um, somewhere around, let me see, I think it was probably the year that my oldest was fourth grade that year, because we had moved to a new place. And so I met some friends who were, um, homeschooling classically. And so I started reading some of their materials and I tried the ages and stages approach for a while. I mean, we tried really hard to be, and it just, it didn't fit. Um, my style is way too relaxed. I need an order and a rhythm of the day, but I, I just couldn't, that much structure was too structured and having babies and moving, it just, it didn't work. So, um, and it didn't fit my concept. Like I said, I've been reading older books and that style of education didn't fit with what I had gotten from the older books that I've been reading. So, but the ideas of studying Latin, learning the classical languages, of course, you know, C.S. Lewis did that. So, of course, you should do that. Not that I was ever managed to teach that to my own kids. Um, I used to say I taught beginning Latin for a long time. <laughs> I tried a lot of different beginning Latin programs. And we did a lot of beginning Latin. 
um, but we never got too far. Um, my older kids took online classes from somebody who taught them Latin and my younger kids just kind of didn't get it, you know, cause we just, I didn't have it myself and there wasn't time, you know. There, so there's only so much time. There's too many good things. You just can't do even all the good things. Right, right. So I miss that, but it's not, I don't feel like we gave up. Um, I don't think, feel like we gave that up in favor of worse things. You know, it, it was good things that we were choosing that didn't have time for that. And, um, yeah, I think, that? you know, I think so that's I think really around that the the stuff that I was learning from my classical friends fit well in a lot of ways with the older books and my ideas about education but maybe not the exact methods and so I kind of just cobbled things together for a while and like I said the online classes for older kids and then I discovered Ambleside Online when my my younger set I've got kind of a gap between my four and then I've got three younger ones so when the oldest of my younger set was ready for first grade I took all three of them and we did Ambleside Online year one together so we just did together, all of us, using Ambleside, and that was wonderful. That was so good for all of us. You know, I think it's really encouraging, too, for moms to hear, especially right now, I feel like we're just inundated with so much information and not like good and bad information. I mean, there's plenty of bad information, but there's so much good information, so many good options, so many good books you could be reading, good you know, things you could be studying, languages, and I don't know, there's just so much that's good. And we can kind of start feeling overwhelmed, or I can start feeling overwhelmed thinking of all the things you're not doing. Right. Like you're a failure because you're not doing all the good things mom A is doing and all the things mom B is doing. And oh no, look at this person on the internet who just told me I should also be doing this other thing. And um, it's really good to hear that you can have a good education full of good, beautiful things and not have done all of the possibilities. Um, I think we just need to remember that. Like we're finite human beings. We can't do everything. And right. our own family, our own unique family, and us as mom, like who is the person that God made us to be, the perfect mother for our unique children, we get to have freedom to pick and choose among the good things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read... Um... Clay and Sally Clarkson's book, Educating the Wholehearted Child. That was another early one that I read. And they said that in there. They said, God gave your children to you on purpose. So whatever you have to offer them, God means for you to give that to them. Um, not that you're supposed to neglect important things, but you don't have to be ruled by the idea that there's one right way to homeschool every kid. Because um, that's not that, that's not the way it works. Yeah. Well, what have been some of your favorite parts of homeschooling? I guess we've talked about that some a little bit. And then have there been any in you know, particular struggles of homeschooling? And how have you kind of overcome and grown in those over the years? Yes. Um, my favorite part, well, my favorite part, I think, was always just all of us being at home together. And um, I always loved not being tied to a traditional school year, you know, so we could travel and visit relatives when it fit our schedule or my husband's work or when nobody else was going to be traveling so that it was easier and less expensive, you know, that kind of thing. So there was the flexibility was good. Um, after my husband retired from the military, we bought some acreage. We lived in Virginia for 14 years and we're not there now, but we had acreage and we had um, chickens and goats and, um, you know, raised a lot of different, different kinds of poultry. We raised a pig one time. <laughs> it's just... So we had the freedom to do that kind of thing um, while homeschooling. I loved that. I loved that year that we started Ambleside Online when I still had all my children at home. The, the older kids who were high school age and had a lot of their own studies, but they sat in with us for um, morning prayers and for poetry and for Plutarch. And then they would go do their own thing while I did our island story, you know, with the younger kids. and. All of that. And then in the afternoon when the younger kids were having their quiet time, I would meet with the older kids and we had things that we were reading together. We'd read Shakespeare together, that sort of thing. I read The Fairy Queen with them. Um, and then we had discussions. So that, there was two or three years maybe when everybody was still home and things were just going really well. It's just kind of the, the golden years in my memory. I just, and I was very aware of it while it was happening, that, that this was really very special and brilliant and couldn't last because the older kids were getting older and, you know, so, um, 
anyway, that was a very precious time. That's kind of where I am right now because my oldest is 15 and my youngest is five. And so everyone can like go to the bathroom by themselves and buckle themselves and like get their own breakfast and lunch. It's this great, you know, time period. Don't have kind of gone past the diaper stage. Um, but I still have everyone home and we come together and we have our poetry and our prayer and our, our shared, our shared family culture time in the morning before it the older ones have their independent work, like very much like you were saying. And I just think about that. I'm like only two more years. Like it's kind of sad, but it makes me really appreciate and want to continue to prioritize those times that we do spend together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful time. It is. Well, what about some of those challenges? I know there were some. <laughs> yeah. Well, the hard thing for me was always math. Um, I just, I, I had come to the impression during my school education that I was no good at math, which as an adult later, when I read um, Paul Lockhart's The Mathematician's Lament, if you ever read that, it was an eye opener. Oh, okay, read that. It was such an eye opener because what happened was I was really good at math before I went to school and school wrecked it, okay? Because I was thinking mathematically, but I was not good at memorizing formulas and then regurgitating them, which is how math is taught. I don't know if they still teach it that way, but that's how it was when I was in school. You just memorize and regurgitate. They didn't want to know if you were thinking or if you understood. It was just, can you follow the formula? And I was just not good at that. So when I started teaching my children math, um, my main goal was for them not to hate it. <laughs> and that, that worked out for all of them except for one, the one that struggled the most. And then we felt like she just needs math drills to get her math facts and oh, poor thing. <laughs> Um, it just it wrecked it for her. But she's, as an adult now, she started teaching, taking math classes and she loves it now. So um, what I did was mostly I kept math really, really low key and we played games and we did, I mean, I had a kid assigned to set the table and they had to count out all that silverware, you know, things like that. So I tried to think of, and we cooked a lot and we cooked from scratch and you know, there's a lot. And when you have a big family, you're always at least doubling a recipe. So there's a lot of math that goes on that way. So most real life stuff and just playing, you know, card games and things like that. And then um, when they got older, I got them a tutor, like when they were high school level. So because um, I did not want them to hate math and think that they were failures like I did. So that was the just to keep it low key. And, um, and so as long as we were able to keep it low key, it worked. But when we started getting stressed out, like you don't know your math facts, then, then they got stressed out and then they felt horrible and they hated it. And... Yeah. A lot of times it's just developing that, that attitude of love and wonder. I mean, we talk about wonder when we talk about going outside or wonders, we, you know, do nature study or read a poem. But math deserves wonder too. It is beautiful and reflects the character of God. And as soon as we kind of know, it's not something we wonder about. We've just got to like drool and kill this. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not very fun. Well, let's talk about one of your areas of great interest. I know that you love medieval and Renaissance lit. And I want to talk to you a little bit about this. Um, basically, I do this podcast so that I have an excuse to talk to cool people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I remember reading The Discarded Image by C.S. Lewis in high school and just having this mind-blown moment realizing how differently the medieval people viewed themselves and the world around them in contrast to how I did. And that really struck me and made me realize that as I'm reading these works of literature, it's important for me to understand the framework that the author's are coming from. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear what first grabbed your attention about medieval and Renaissance lit. And then could you kind of give us a few of the key distinctives of medieval thinking? Okay. Um, the, what first grabbed my attention, like I said, I grew up reading a lot of fairy tales and I had a book of King Arthur stories and that sort of thing that I just, I always loved those things. And then when I got too old for fairy tales. I started reading science fiction. <laughs> and um, a lot of the really best science fiction has a lot of the same, I don't know, soul that's in the medieval stuff. But I didn't think of myself as liking medieval stories or anything. But um, I, well, I, and this has actually been fairly recently, within maybe seven or eight years ago, 
I happened to mention to Angelina Stanford that I liked that hideous strike the best of all of the three, the space trilogy. And I said, I love that hideous strength. It's my favorite one because most people don't like it and they don't understand it or anything. I said, but it's my favorite one. And she said, well, of course you like it best. It's the most medieval. Ah. And that just, I thought, I like she could see something in me that that's what I was drawn to. And so um, I think it's the, well, and that's when I started maybe paying more attention to medieval literature and started noticing that actually a lot of the stuff that I do like, I mean, I love King Arthur, obviously that's medieval. And um, the Song of Roland is not medieval, but it's some of the foundational stuff that feeds into the medieval romances, um, stories like that. And, you know, the fairy queen and everything. I just think that it's, well, like you talked about wonder, there's, there's that element of it that's present. I mean, medieval literature is weird. And I like that. <laughs> so, um, there's, the, the more you get into the medieval imagination, the more you see, well, like in the discarded image, when he talks about how the medieval mindset was very much um, organizing and categorizing a place for everything and everything in its place. But at the same time, it was rich and beautiful and poetic and harmonious and the whole cosmos as a dance, you know, just those ideas, I think, are what just speaks to my soul. It's kind of like, and maybe because I grew up with the fairy tales and King Arthur, it's a kind of going home, um, you know, maybe it's that kind of thing, but that's where I feel most at home, it seems, when I read various kinds of literature. But you find that soul in a lot of different, like I mentioned, um, science fiction. There's, you know, a lot of modernistic and other kinds of literature that have that same soul that, that I recognize sometimes. So when, we, when we're thinking about these sort of time periods of literature, I mean, obviously, it's not like someone woke up one morning and was like, and now it's time for the medieval literature to begin, you know, and then one day, oh, and now it's the Renaissance. I mean, this is all sort of a flow and ideas and cultures are, are working themselves out in this way. Um, is there a difference in the approach of like a medieval writer versus a Renaissance writer? What are the things that kind of stay the same or are there things that are changing and distinct? I mean, I, and, and what, for someone who is, you know, really new to this idea, can you get like, who are some of the authors? You mentioned a few, what kind of time period-ish are we thinking about here or talking about? Um, with medieval literature, oh, I'm so not good with dates. In um, the discarded image, though, C.S. Lewis talks about how the, the late antiquity, you know, there's a lot of stuff there that was drawn on so that by the time you get to the eight or nine hundreds, the kind of literature is changing and but it's based on the ancient literature and taking ideas and building on those ideas. And then um, by the time you get to the Renaissance, the um, enlightenment, you know, has happened. So there's again, a, a philosophical kind of change that eventually works its way into the literature. Um, the, what was happening imaginatively in the middle ages, the, um, the idea of the Ptolemaic universe, you know, where the, the earth is the center. And then there's all these nested spheres that um, and all the different planets and everything is circling and it's a great dance. And then the throne of God is outside of that. The, cosmos is this finite created thing that for us standing on earth it's just a straight up and down kind of thing we look up and that's where heaven is and we're down at the bottom which means we're not as modern as we might think being the center of the cosmos means you're the most important but for the medieval it's not exactly it's not that at all you are at the bottom of the universe and that's where the garbage washes off to the bottom like we're the dregs of the universe the best parts are the higher up farther out um, the best part. So it's a very humble approach to the cosmos and um, watching the stars and watching the planets to see what they do and see how all that fits the model. Um, so one of the things about the medieval mindset is that they knew that their perspective was limited, that we can't see the universe the way God does. We can only see what's happening around us. And so we have this theoretical model, this Ptolemaic system, but we need to be sure that the data that we perceive actually fits that model and can be explained by that model. Um, they use the phrase saving the appearances. That means the things that appear to us in nature, we need to figure out do they fit or not. Um, 
And if they don't fit, maybe the model needs to change. So what happened eventually was, um, well, Copernicus with his idea, you know, things had gotten so complicated that he thought, what if it's the sun that's in the middle and everything's going around the sun? And that actually simplified things and it made things fit better. So they started thinking along those lines and then um, maybe it's, they're not circular orbits, maybe they're elliptical orbits. But then the thing that was the most um, shocking and kind of traumatic happened was a nova was discovered. And that was in, I think it's 1572, a new star. So prior to that time, the idea was that everything below the moon, obviously everything down here changes. We see life and birth and death. But everything beyond the moon doesn't appear to change. It circles around. There are cycles. But the cycles just show their full unchanging nature. That They're not actually changing. There's no growth and death. But then that new star was discovered. So clearly there was something the previous model hadn't accounted for that it's changing out there. So that was kind of a, that was a really mind blowing thing. So philosophically, how do you account for that? So you're seeing a lot of that in the Renaissance. And um, this is happening during Elizabethan England. And a lot of the Renaissance literature, there's so much happening. The model had to be simplified. And then it was radically changed because everything outside the moon is not necessarily unchanging. And new lands are being discovered, this whole continent that they didn't know existed. And you know all the exploration and everything. So there's this fabulous time of exploration and growth of knowledge that's really exciting um, for the people living then. But in a sense, there's a simplification of the very complex medieval model of the cosmos. So it's kind of, they seem opposites, but they fit together because they harmonized everything still. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that's kind of what's going on philosophically. Now, in the stories, because the imaginative universe of the Middle Ages is so beautiful and so rich, those um, motifs and those metaphors continue to be passed down in literature for a long, long time. So the literature doesn't change right away. Even in Shakespeare, um, in his plays, he talks about the cosmos very much like a medieval person would, even though obviously he knew that it's not the earth is in the middle and everything goes around. Um, but those metaphors and those ideas are so beautiful and so powerful that they stay in literature for a long time afterwards. Well, even, of course, C.S. Lewis, highly influenced by Spencer and all of those um, ideas. I remember after reading The Discarded Image, going and reading um, Voyage of the Dawn Treader and just being like, wait a minute, <laughs> what's happening here? You stole all these ideas. Now I know where they came from. Yes. He's very deliberately reintroducing medieval ideas in his stories. That, that's what he was doing. I heard a story recently that when he, um, I don't know if it was when he wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but when he, um, part of what inspired him to write them was that during the bombing of London and kids were being evacuated from London, that he was around a lot of children who just had no imagination, mm -hmm. that um, they were already suffering the effects of modern ideas of education and what children need to read and everything. And, and it was tragic. And so part of his um, stimulus for writing those stories was to reintroduce this whole imaginative world to young readers. Wow, that is fascinating. I and have not heard that. Yeah. yeah. Well, someone may be thinking, okay, well, this is all very interesting, but why does this topic matter? Um, why is it important for us to understand these ideas and study medieval and Renaissance literature now? Well, at least two things. The one thing would be because if you're reading older literature, like you said earlier, you need to know where they're coming from. Um, if they talk about, I don't know, when, but when they talk about things, you need to know what they meant when they said it so that you don't misunderstand what they're saying. So part of it is just as a part of our literary heritage, we, we need to understand what the metaphors were about so that we can understand the literature. But then the other thing, in, um, in his studies of medieval and Renaissance literature, C.S. Lewis, specifically when he's talking about Spencer and um, Ariosto, Orlando Furioso, those stories, he said that style of storytelling, when read receptively, has psychotherapeutic powers. It can heal your soul. So um, 
I'm always game for reading literature that's going to bring order and harmony and healing. Yes, <laughs> <So>. indeed. <laughs> we could all use more of that. <laughs> well, if someone wanted to start exploring some of these authors or ideas, I would love to hear what you would suggest for the, like the beginner titles. Are there particular ideas they should be looking for? Or what questions should they be asking, especially if they're new to medieval or Renaissance lit? Right. If you're very, very new, really, the Chronicles of Narnia, the questions you could be asking, like you mentioned the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, because then that one used to scrub as so very much a modern kid, so very much influenced by modern education and that kind of thing. Um, he is, you know, poor kid. He is one of those men without chest that Lewis talks about in The Abolition of Man. He has no soul, no imagination, um, no love for any of the good things. So in, in his stories, just reading and absorbing those and noticing um, what he's saying about, like, what is it to be virtuous? Because it's not necessarily what we think of as virtue. Um, that's a good place to start for very beginners. And of course, just reading fairy tales and, and even the mythology so that you're beginning to have those um, reference points so that if somebody mentions Apollo, you know what that means. It's not just, I don't know, a guy with arrows or sun. You know, Apollo stood for music and light and healing and poetry and education and the laurel was sacred to him. So anybody who's crowned with laurel leaves, that's a reference to Apollo. Um, anytime you run across laurel leaves, which happens in um, the silver chair when Eustace and Jill are sitting outside behind the gymnasium and she's been bullied and she's crying and it's this horrible modern experiment house school. And while they're sitting there and Jill's just kind of been pouring out her heart to Eustace and he's sitting there just being sympathetic. And it says they sat, um, the drops dripped off of the laurel leaves just that little phrase that nature is weeping with them because of how horrible what they're being subjected to is in education. Apollo was the patron god of the education of the young and the laurel is his leaf, his, his tree. So anything that you read that gives you those references that helps you understand that kind of thing um, can help you, you know, get more into the literature. Um, C.S. Lewis's discarded image um, one that might be a little easier to read than that initially is um, Tilliard's book, the, the Elizabethan World Picture, because he's talking about it. Like I said, the, the Renaissance, the Elizabethan model was based on the medieval model, but much simplified. So when Tilliard is talking about the Elizabethan World Picture, he's giving you a really simple outline of this Elizabethan thought. And then that'll be a step closer to the medieval thought. So it can help be kind of a transition for you to move back that direction. Um, C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, because of him talking about the nature of education, that's, it's, what he's saying is radical. It is, because he is so against modern education, which is what almost all of us have been brought up under for the last hundred and something years. So if, if we look at our grandparents' education and it's better than ours, my grandmother learned Latin in a one-room schoolhouse in rural Arkansas. But, you know, still, when she was ready to teach school in the 1920s, she had to go to a normal school, which is um, like a teacher's college. But the normal school is the federal government has decided we need everybody to be educated exactly the same way and it needs to be modern. And so the teachers have to go there before they can teach. And that started 100 years ago, at least. Wow. That is fascinating. I have to tell you, when you were telling the quote from The Silver Chair, I have read the Chronicles of Narnia a million times. I mean, I still have like my childhood copies and they're falling all to pieces. And I have never picked up on that illusion. And I was just like, oh, getting all the shivers. That is just, uh, it makes me want to go back and reread the whole series again, every time, just like really paying attention to those details because Lewis, you know, is doing these things on purpose. That was so exciting. Yeah, he was brilliant. <laughs> he yes. Just well, Kelly, I am asking these questions to all of my guests this season. And so the first question is just, what are you reading right now? Or not like right the second. <laughs> yeah. I always have too many things going at one time. <laughs> I'm, um, so I'm reading, 
this is interesting. Um, so Philip Sidney's Arcadia, this is a um, pastoral romance, which I have heard a lot about, but I've never read. I've read pastoral romances before, but I've never read this one. And I'm, I got interested in this one because I had just read, well, I've just taught our, my local co-op, King Lear. And when I was teaching King Lear, I found out that the character of Gloucester and his two sons, that subplot came from Philip Sidney's Arcadia. So I thought, okay, I, I'm going to read that then. And also I am reading the Mabinogian, which is a collection of Welsh tales. And, and I started reading it because King Lear himself um, is a Welsh god in the ancient days. Um, right, prior to, well, if you know um, Geoffrey of Monmouth, the story of King Lear and his daughters is in Geoffrey of Monmouth. So he was a legendary king at the time of the 1200s or whenever he was writing. But way before that, he was an ancient Celtic god of the sea. And there are all these stories about his children that just come into the whole British imagination. The, the stories of, um, there are a lot of fairy tales that are based on his stories and his children. The, the ballet Swan Lake is based on a whole stream of stories that are about his children. And so it's a, yeah, so that I went into that. And the Mabinogian also, it goes from these early stories about the children of Lear and some of the things that happened to them. And then it morphs into King Arthur stories. So I'm about halfway through that. That's exciting. Um, I'm going to have to look into that. My daughter, my 13-year-old daughter did NaNoWriMo um, this past fall, and her setting was Wales, and it was sort of like a fantasy thing. So she wanted to bring in elements of like Welsh mythology and legends, and I was like, I don't know any. <laughs> so she was having to try to do some research on her own and find books at the library, but that sounds like something she would love to read. Yeah, she should read that. It's really good. And I have it on audio, but too, the, the translation that I have, oh, it's back in my bedroom. Um, let me see. The translator's name is Shanid Davis, and the names are all Welsh, and I cannot pronounce them. And so I got the audiobook of the same translation, so I'm listening to it and reading along. The audiobook is delightful. I love this narrator. It's so, it just brings it to life. I, I, I love that. So that's a good, a good thing to do. Because the names are weird. I would not have ever known how to pronounce. There's this one name that's spelled P-W-Y-L-L. -L. I would have said Quill or something, but it's Poich because Welsh is very strange. I have Welsh ancestry, so I feel like I need to honor that. <laughs> but it is a very strange language. <laughs> It's like when, when Gaelic words or something will show up and I'm like, I have no idea how to pronounce it because I know it has nothing to do with what I would expect phonetically yeah. this to sound like. Right, right. Sometimes I think they should just use a different alphabet. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that I'm reading Agatha Christie for fun and I'm reading um, a book called Sidney and Spencer, the poet as maker, and it's the relationship between Philip Sidney and well, Philip Sidney's work and Edmund Spencer, because it's not clear that they ever actually knew each other, but Spencer so much admired Sidney and um, imitated a lot of his work. And Sidney had read some of Spencer's work, The Shepherd's Calendar, and talked about it in his, um, the defense of poesy that he wrote. He talks about The Shepherd's Calendar. So it's kind of how their works influenced each other and mostly how Spencer's work grew out of Sidney's work. So that's interesting. Oh man, I'm going to have to go and dig out my, my library, my library hold list. And I, I doubt any of these books are the library. So it probably means I'll have to just make, put, make another thrift books order. But <laughs> <laughs> Carly, my next question for you, and it's been really fun to hear all the different answers to this, but what tips would you give to a homeschool mom when the homeschool day just seems to be going all wrong? Um, go outside. <laughs> it's just send the children outside. They need to be outside anyway. And even for myself, I have found that if things are just horrible, if I just go outside, really, it really does help. And that being outside and being in nature to me is so important. You know, I should have said this even when I'm talking about the medieval and, you know, needing to know things about the medieval mind. Being in touch with nature and knowing your local trees and you know, birds and flowers and those things, knowing your seasons, your weather, 
knowing how all of that works and the whole cycle of life and birth and death, that's so intrinsic to medieval literature. I mean, they mostly lived outside and we're so cut off for that, from that that we miss an awful lot of the significance of what's happening in the stories because we don't know what season it is when they say it was the season when this was happening and that should trigger certain things in the reader's imagination. Um, yeah, so the more time you spend outside, the more it's just, I think it's just healing to your soul anyway, being out and just seeing the clouds. You don't have to study. You don't have to memorize anything about clouds. You just rest and, you know, um, lift your eyes up to God. The heavens declare the glory of God. It's healing just to go outside and be in nature. And so that is exactly what, if my kids are getting rowdy, you need to go outside now. If they're being loud, that's an outside voice. Go outside. <laughs> if you want to be inside, you have to be quiet and decorous because we behave a different way inside than we do outside. And um, it's even healing for me to go out, go out and take a walk and just de-stress. Clears your mind. Then you can come back and reset. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Sometimes in the middle of the day, she's like, um, I'm going to go out for a walk all by myself. <laughs> Just for a little bit. And it's amazing how just even a, a little reset outside can really make a difference in your attitude. Mm -hmm. Well, Kelly, where can people find you all around the internet? Well, I am. I have a blog. I'm not a very good blogger, um, but that's badgermom.blogspot.com. And I can spell that out later if you need that. I am also on, um, I'm teaching classes through the House of Humane Letters. So I've done a couple of webinars, it's like I did a webinar on As You Like It and on King Lear. I'm actually doing a series of mini classes on recovering the medieval imagination. And so that's called Seeking the Discarded Image. And I've got two sets of that done. I've got at least a third set planned for the future. And then, like I said, I'm, I'm gonna be teaching the Fairy Queen there starting in August. And my Fairy Queen class is geared towards homeschool moms. It's gonna be in the evening and have a more relaxed kind of schedule. It's not gonna be the tight school schedule to give moms time to read and have a break to catch up. And cause I know what it's like. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and what better way to, to get some rejuvenation time than to read the Fairy Queen? Oh yes. So all six books and um, so we'll read a book and then have a break and read a book and have a break. So there'll be time to, um, get caught up or let it sink in before we go on to the next book. So I'll spend the first class just introducing the next book. And then we'll have four classes where we'll cover three candos at a time. So we're gonna move kind of quickly through it when we get to each book, then there'll be a break week. And then the next week is another introduction. So no homework due. Um, and then read the next, we'll have a long break over Christmas because um, January is dark and dull and I don't work. I, I can't, my brain. <laughs> I have to rest. <laughs> so school will start back at the beginning of February and then we'll, um, you know, have the next three books plus the Cantos of Mutability. So anyway, I'm excited about that. I'm really looking forward to that. I've been wanting, so many people want to have read it and be able to read it to their children and are intimidated because it's a huge book. It's huge and it's archaic language. And so anyway, I'm looking forward to introducing people to it and just helping them get through it so they can read it to their own kids. It's great. Kids love it. Kids are intimidated by it if you're reading it to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I will definitely have links to that in the show notes for this episode at humilityanddoxology.com. And this has been such a delightful conversation. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs>